Right, thank you all for coming on this rather wonderful uh, British summer night. We don't get many of these, so I appreciate why you're here. And also you've come into the old lecture theatre, uh, which is traditionally reserved for events of great significance <laughs> in LSC. My name is Toby Dodge and I'm a professor of international relations. But much more importantly than that, we've come both to celebrate and examine the publication of this, a new book by Christian Chinkin and uh, Mary Caldor, International Law and New uh, Wars. And I think uh, I've been reading it uh, since it was kindly sent to me. I think it's a, a superb book, um, it, it, a combination of uh, two friends and colleagues, but also two globally renowned scholars in international law, political or international sociology, international relations have come together to do something rather remarkable. So today, we're going to let both uh, Christine and Mary speak for about 10 minutes each, and then uh, Dr. Solana will also speak to for about 10 or 15 minutes about the significance of the book, and then we'll throw it open to questions. Now, International Law and New Wars examines how international law, quite simply and brutally, fails to address the contemporary experience of what Mary actually has coined the phrase of new wars, instances of disorganized, fluid, informal armed conflict and violence in places like Syria, Ukraine, Libya, Mali, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and South Sudan. So international law largely constructed in the 19th and 20th century is, an, we could argue, is an outmoded concept which does little to regulate these. Now, I think I can't think of two. I can't think of two more qualified people to write this book. Christine Chinkin is founder of the director, is founding director of the Center for Women, Peace, and Security at LSE, and an, inter, an emeritus professor of international law. I think we can say that the Queen herself has recently recognised her global expertise <laughs> in awarding her Companion of the Order of St Michael and St George (CMG), which stands for Call Me God. So keep that in mind when you ask questions. <laughs> Mary Caldor is a, prof a renowned professor of global governance and the director of the Conflict and Civil Society Research Unit at the London School of Economics and a professor in international development as well. And she, as I've just said, has pioneered the concept of new wars, which I think is very rare for an academic to come up with an analytical unit that has shaped so much writing. Dr. Javier Solana um, is a distinguished fellow in foreign policy at the, Bro uh, the Brookings Institution and a senior fellow at Hertie School of Governance but I think you may well know him as the former Secretary General of NATO, the European Union High Representative for Common, and for Common Foreign and Security Policy, and the Secretary General of the Council for the European Union. So each of our esteemed academics and practitioners will speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll throw it open. Now, here is what's so wonderful about book launches. When we're finished, Mary and Christine will go and sit outside and will sell you their books with a signature at a reduced rate. <laughs> and we take the number of books sold in their hundreds or their thousands, depending on how captivated by, you've been by this book. Now, I got it for free, but I've read it. And I, <laughs> that don't, that don't, that you shouldn't pay attention to the first bit. It's superb, and I think it, it is a, it, it's very well written. And it's very insightful, and uh, these two professors are going to convince you to run out and buy it at a reduced rate. So who's going to speak first? Me. Mary. It's quite a heavy book. <laughs> well, only, only in weight, but not in content. <laughs> well, the hardback's even heavier. Um, well, thank you, Toby. That was a lovely introduction. And I just wanted to start by saying how delighted we are that Javier Solana could be here, because all this began with him. Um, I convened a study group when he was the uh, high representative for common foreign and security policy to think about it was just the beginning of a European security strategy, which he really pioneered. And it was to think about the kind of European security capabilities um, that we should have. And, um, you know, we worked on this for a year and then we said, what shall we call it? And after a lot of discussion, we decided to call it human security, a human security approach, even though actually at that time we hadn't engaged in any of the big debates about human security. And so once we'd done it, we started thinking about these big debates. And what we realized is that our version of human security, which was very much the way that Javier had conceived European foreign policy, was actually quite distinct from the famous UNDP 
idea of human security, which was very much linked to development, and also the Canadian version, which was very much linked to human rights and later sort of morphed into responsibility to protect. What our version was about, which was really at the heart of Javier's security policy, is that Europe's more secure through the extension of a law-based form of security. And it's all about the extension of international law. It's all about what we enjoy inside rights-based societies is human security. We expect there to be firefighters and police, even if they don't always turn up. Well, they do turn up, I mean, even if councils don't provide support. But we expect those things to be available. And that's what we mean. We, we normally have human security. And what European security policy was about is extending that idea of human security to the rest of the world. So when we made this argument, Christine, who was the lawyer in the group, kept saying, what law? <laughs> what law are you talking about? And um, that's what the book was about. We decided we would write a book about what sort of law we would talk about. Now, this book has taken us 10 years to write. <laughs> it's taken us a very long time, and I do want to say that we are incredibly grateful to the European Research Council, which gave me a five-year advance grant. And, you know, one of the terrible things that could happen as a result of Brexit is that those wonderful opportunities, which are really unique to the European Research Council, might be taken away from us in the uh, academic world. We also had support from DFID and the Open Society, so I want to include our acknowledgement of them. Now, it was an absolutely fantastic experience working with Christine. We never compromised. We never said, oh, okay, you have, let's have it your way. We argued, we were very Habermasian. We argued every time we disagreed, we argued it out until we thought we'd reached the right answer. <laughs> And actually, it was enormous fun. I mean, in between talking about our grandchildren and our children and all of those things, we had these great discussions. So now and let glasses of wine. And glasses <laughs> of wine, exactly. And dinners and, and Coopers. Dinners. <laughs> and now a few words about the content of the book. Um, the basic argument, which Toby's already told you, is that international law, as it relates to the use of force, and the use of force in international law really refers to military force, so it's about war and peace, <coughs> we argue was developed in the 19th and 20th centuries for European wars and doesn't fit contemporary wars like the ones we're seeing in Syria, Iraq, um, or Congo. And Christine will talk more about that. I'm not going to say why that is. What I want to say is that when we began thinking about it, we, th we were still basking in the afterglow of the end of the Cold War, and we thought the world was moving towards a more liberal world order and towards human security, and we were going to show how law had to change. But actually, what has been happening is quite the opposite. The world has been moving in many different and very dangerous directions. So we decided on a different approach, <coughs> which was to develop models of security, uh, which showed, because actually the world's moving in several different directions at the same time. And so we looked at those models and we looked at what they meant for international law. And I'll very briefly tell you what the models are, very briefly, because I'm nearly at the end of my 10 minutes, aren't I? I've got five minutes. Oh, good. So the first model is geopolitics, which is actually the old Cold War model, which is security, international security is about having military forces to be able to defend the state from another state. And I don't need to say more about that. The second model is the war on terror, which is about having, even if Obama and others don't call it that, it's about ha using force in the international law sense against non-state actors, namely terrorists. <coughs> and 
this model has spawned a whole new complex of people, not just military forces, but intelligence agencies, huge numbers of intelligence agencies, private security contractors, and new types of tactics, notably drones attacks. Uh, and Christine will again will talk about, but it's stretched the way international law is understood. It's entered things like preemptive self-defense. It's stretched international humanitarian law, so Bush invented this concept of illegal combatants. And it's naturalized targeted assassinations, which is what drones are. The third model is the liberal peace, and that is the dramatic increase in multilateral interventions that we've seen since the end of the Cold War, undertaken by the UN, the EU, the African Union, and numerous international institutions. And it involves what Duffield calls a strategic complex of NGOs, peacekeeping forces, international agencies. And our argument there is that liberal peace has spawned a new post-bellum law which largely consists of numerous peace agreements. And the problem with these peace agreements is they're very top-down and they focus on negotiations among the warring parties who've often committed both war crimes and economic crimes. They're kind of like giving international legitimation to mafia truces. And while such agreements, which actually are very difficult to achieve, uh, and in 50% of the cases they do stop the violence between warring parties, they actually allow for continued predatory activities uh, against civilians. So even though the liberal peace maybe had its heart in the right place, it's also produced some very problematic outcomes. The fourth model is responsibility to protect, which is about using military force to protect people from massive violations of human rights, ethnic cleansing, and genocide. And the problem that we say has to, it, with responsibility to protect is the contradiction between means and ends. Military force by its nature violates human rights. So how can you use military force in order to protect people from human rights? And we talk about the problems in both Kosovo and Libya, where the aim was to protect people using airstrikes. So the ends were good, but the means were highly problematic, and we can talk about that more later. So we end up with our fifth model, which is what we put forward, which we call second generation human security. And we call it second generation really to distinguish it. I mean, the first generation was very much a discussion about concepts of human security. Uh, this is about practical implementation. And I won't go into detail about what we propose on practical implementation, but it's much more bottom up in our approach and it involves economic and social approaches as well as political approaches. We do think human security needs a new language. Uh, international law was aimed at mitigating suffering in war, but by doing that, it also made war legitimate. <laughs> And the UN Charter prohibited war. And human security means taking that prohibition seriously. And we need to reconceptualize human security, we argue, as a humanitarian catastrophe, not as a legitimate phenomenon. Just to give you an example, <coughs> at the time of the 9-11 attacks, both Christine and I said the 9-11 attacks should be described as a crime against humanity, not as an attack by a foreign state. Bush chose to treat it as an attack by a foreign state, and, this, and that allowed him to go to war in Afghanistan and Iraq on self-defense grounds. Had it been a crime against humanity, it would have, the response would have involved uh, policing, uh, legal mechanisms, judicial me mechanisms, and intelligence, um, and a much more international approach. So what we're actually suggesting is doing the opposite. We think attacks on countries, even if they're undertaken by states, should be treated as crimes against humanity. 
And that has huge implications for how you think about international law. Now, finally, um, if we are, a final point I want to make, which is why we favor the human security model. We favor the human security model because we actually think it's the only model that will work in addressing contemporary conflicts. And addressing contemporary conflicts is hugely important because it has ramifications for all of us, terrorism, refugees, and so on. And if we understand human security as an extension of rights-based law, absolutely central is the construction of legitimate institutions. And I suppose our argument is really that human security actually has a better chance of commanding widespread legitimacy than any of the other models, and that's why it needs to be a focus. One other thing, actually, that I meant to say earlier, but some of the things I've been talking about in relation to human security have already and are being taken up by the UN, and I should mention in particular the new EU global, security, global strategy which is explicit about adopting a human security approach. Excellent, thank you for keeping time, Mary. Christy. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you did, yes. Very good. Uh, thank you, Toby, and also thank you very much, Javier, for coming this evening. Um, the background to the book for me, as, as Mary said 10 years ago, was that she invited me to join the human security group. And I think what she was really looking for was a tame lawyer who would agree with all the various sort of suggestions <laughs> that was be, were being put up. Um, we then started teaching a human security course together, which I think also generated a great deal of the discussion and so on. But the other background to the book for me was that joining the human security group talking to, uh, and becoming a colleague of Mary's and um, brought to me as an international lawyer a completely new different world. It was Mary's world of new wars, of human security, of liberal peace, of the political economy of war um, and concepts and principles that Mary engages with very readily, very easily, but which simply do not translate into an international legal system which is based around state sovereignty, a state-centric system, state regulation. So principles such as legitimacy, responsibility to protect, human security. These were all concepts that I began thinking, well, you know, where do they fit? How can an international law address any of these issues? So the sort of exchange collaboration that began was very much from Le uh, learning on both sides, yeah, I think, absolutely. because... Yeah, uh, I've such a lot And, you know, you have this great idea that, well, international law could do that. That's it. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an issue of international law. And I think even more so, perhaps, is that international law is a very top-down system for, you know, Security Council, um, treaty-making, etc. And Mary's work has consistently been, of course, the bottom up, civil society and methods of how civil society can influence um, the top down. So that was another area of considerable um, learning and problem for me as an international lawyer. And I would add that there's another dimension to the book that Mary hasn't mentioned, which is that I also insisted that the work that I've done on women gender and so on throughout my career have to, has to come into the book. And so we have tried to bring a feminist lens, um, a gender lens throughout the discussion of the book. We haven't done it systematically. It's certainly not comprehensive. Um, it's raised many other problems and that's our next project, <laughs> <laughs> is to explore more fully um, the gender dimensions. Um, Mary and Toby have already pretty well explained the argument of the book. Um, but I think to go back to the issues relating to the inadequacy of an international legal re regime for the regulation of the use of force in today's contemporary forms of conflict, um, it's worth pointing out for those of you who are not international lawyers that there are in fact three legal regimes that regulate the use of force. The first is the so-called um, use ad bello, which is use ad bellum, which is, are the laws that regulate when states can use force, the going to use force. The second is the use in bello, which is the international humanitarian law, the laws of war, the laws that regulate the use of force once you've actually got a conflict. The third is weapons law, 
and that is the regulation of weapons through arms control, dis disarmament, humanitarian approaches to weapons. So we've got three separate regimes. They've all evolved separately. They've got some overlap, but not much. But the point is that they have all evolved over a period of time, regulating a form of conflict which is very different from today's forms of conflict. And so what has happened so since 1945, the creation of the United Nations Charter, is that these le legal regimes have become surrounded by contestation around their interpretation and application. They've become subject to claims and counterclaims that seek to stretch, push the barriers, push the um, limits of international law according to what is seen as the best interests of the particular state that is making the particular claim. So unprincipled in any sort of meta international law sense, a, an essentially national interest approach to the extension of international law and very much pushing international law as to what we perceived as dangerous areas, weakening the constraints upon violence in international affairs that were agreed upon in the post-1945 international legal order. So we get multiple claims of legality, notably by the permanent members, the five permanent members of the Security Council, for the different forms of military operation that they enter into. And whether or not these are widely accepted, what the other responses from other states are, they have reduced the certainty and predictability of international law and have very much underpinned a trend away from law towards differing concepts of legitimacy in place of legality. We saw this very clearly with the Iraq invasion 2003. Um, I think we're seeing it today with debates around arms exports to Saudi Arabia. They also uphold a very imperialist view of international law. Claims that are made by the Western or the Northern powers always gain far more attention than those that are made from states from the South. So the legality of military intervention in international law is assessed according to what happened in Kosovo, Iraq, Ukraine, rather than the DRC or Mali, for instance. And Open any international law textbook, you'll find almost no mention of the use of force in states such as the DRC, Mali, Somalia, South Sudan. Those are not the areas that normative frameworks of international law are created through. So from an international law perspective, what does all of this mean? And it seemed to us that there are um, sort of three possible alternatives. Either we have to reconceptualize international law and find new ways of lawmaking. Um, or secondly, we have to think about the actual precepts of international law and rethink those. Or thirdly, we just say international law is pointless. Let's throw up our arms, put away the um, international law textbooks and forget all about international law. So what the book does is essentially go through these three legal regimes, um, use in bello, use ad bellum and um, 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 just arms control in general, weapons law, and look at the various ways in which international law has been stretched, look at um, the various ways in which the claims that are being made, particularly in the context of self-defense, preemptive self-defense. Um, we've seen a re-emergence of the idea of um, use of force being legal if a government that may or may not be the legitimate government of a state invites another state in for military intervention. Crimea um, is a good example of that. Um, we've seen in Iraq, Afghanistan, Ukraine, South Ossetia, we can go on and on, different ways in which international law is used and abused. And I think another trend has been the formation of ad hoc coalitions of the willing. Um, these have been described by one commentator as, quote, the antithesis of the maintenance of international legal order by the international community. It dispenses for the need of Security Council authorization, while at the same time pretending that it's multilateral action. Again, the whole notion of self-defense, the one legal basis for the use of force under the UN Charter, is essentially reduced to nothing or, alternatively, to everything. So we then look at international humanitarian law. Um, international humanitarian law rests upon a fundamental distinction between international armed conflict, non-international armed conflict, with legal consequences flowing. 
how does that possibly work out in the context of new wars when essentially what we have is a networked conflict between armed groups operating constantly across state borders, civilian populations fleeing across borders, network of armed groups operating across borders, including traffickers, criminal gangs, those who engage in terror, all the personnel of new wars. The fundamental distinction of IHL simply breaks down in that particular context. And so too does the notion of the distinction between civilians and combatants. Um, the very objective of new wars is to target civilians in many instances. So in, this, in the context of IHL, international humanitarian law, there hasn't been so much the stretching of claims as engaging different legal regimes international criminal law, human rights law. But then what has emerged is an inconsistent legalism coming from the various tribunals. So for example, different views about what does constitute a legitimate target, when does human rights law apply in conflict, and also strong resistance from the authorities to what has come pejoratively to be called lawfare, fighting war through law and abusing it. So these are the problems of international law. Um, I won't go into the responses that um, Mary has talked about, um, but particularly to just emphasize that what is needed is a mind, mindset shift commensurate with a human security approach. And so the final chapter really picks up on this and talks about it, and also shows how there are some seeds in the international legal system which could be developed and um, brought to the fore so as to create an international law that is focused upon people rather than the classic conception of states. Um, heresy, I might add, for classic international lawyers. Um, but I want to finish, I think my 10 minutes are pretty well up, um, but I just want to finish by saying that we are very aware that the major critique, well, we're probably gonna get lots of critiques, but one of the major critiques that we will get is that we'll be accused of being idealistic and lacking any realism, <laughs> that what we are dealing with is a utopian model. Um, our response is, no, this is not utopian, it's pragmatic. What is evident to us today, looking around the world, is that war methods simply do not work, whether we're in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, Yemen, Somalia, South Sudan, the list goes on. And we have just seen now these continued um, ongoing, extremely violent conflicts, where it is quite obvious that classic war methods are not working. Peace agreements may lead to temporary, maybe even longer lasting ceasefires. They do not stop the violence of ongoing human rights abuses, criminality, attacks on human rights defenders, on peacekeepers, essentially the continuation of new wars. So that we argue that without rethinking, having some reconceptualization, the world will continue to witness naked power, violent exchanges with extremists and terrorists, and civilians across all regions, across all religions, are the major victims through collateral damage and through being directly targeted, through revenge attacks, hostage taking, pursuit of terrorist methods. We argue that the book is a practical rather than an idealistic strategy. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I would like to start by thanking uh, Mary and Christine for having finished this uh, long time expected uh, book. And I, I, I say it honestly because I think that uh, if we have had this book or a, um, a smaller part of it uh, in the times that we needed, things would have been very, very different to my mind. I mean, we got together the first time uh, at the very beginning of the century, with the year 2000, when we met the three of us, and uh, Robert Cooper, which is here also at the first line, which was a very important uh, part of the team also, uh, to, to really think how we handled the problems at that time, in, in particular in the Balkans. Uh, we started all this uh, related to the Balkans. And um, if we were uh, had uh, this debate performed rapidly and uh, the conclusions uh, 
I see that many things would have been done differently at the end there. And uh, no doubt in relation to Libya, for instance, I think that the, the situation that we suffer in Libya and the reaction that the international community had in Libya would not have been the one that we had, having had this already uh, on paper. So the whole thing of the, the evolution of the Arab Springs probably would have taken a very different uh, end. And I say end, although they haven't ended yet, because Syria is still with us, and we don't see really how Syria is going to be over for the moment. Uh, so therefore, I think it's very, very important what you have done. Uh, you may be criticized, you may be called utopian, you may call over-realistic, but I think you have done something very, very useful. And uh, as I said, had I had uh, this book uh, at the time that we were committed, uh, probably we have been done things uh, differently. Now, let me let me concentrate on two or three things that I I I would like to to. I have to look at it into really into more detail. But all the all the, the, the things related to the international law. Uh, these days we are talking about uh, cyber cyber war, which is another another type of the use of war. Which uh, it seems to me that is not really very appropriate. But I mean, we apply the, the term war to many things. But uh, again, we don't know how to do it. We don't know what is legal, what is not legal. It's no declaration of war at all, and uh, you, you use offensive weapons. And, 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 and. So mm, this, this is, is, is so important that the people begin to, 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 to make this operational. And even if you can do it 100%, uh, at least take the first step in that direction, because we are going to be uh, probably in the foreseeable future with many occasions. We are not going to see the clear war from a state to another state, probably, in the many, many years. I hope never again. But we're going to see moments in which force is going to be used, and it has to be used according to the new rules of the game. If not, we will do it really things which will be incompatible with the values that we try to defend, maybe compatible with some law that uh, people invent, but uh, not really with a uh, 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 type of uh, rule of law which is accepted by everybody. Now, the question is, is going to be accepted by everybody, this approach? And the answer is, I don't know. It's questionable. And uh, if it's questionable, how do we handle this? Because it may happen that uh, a permanent member of the Security Council does not accept uh, this thing, this approach. Others, yes, but uh, one or two said no. What do we, how do we handle this, this uh, situation which uh, should not uh, uh, prevent that this type of uh, approaches can be can be done. Now, going to the, the example of responsibility to protect. Responsibility to protect was approved by the, by the General Assembly of the United Nations, the Security Council, everybody approved responsibility to protect. The question was when it was used, uh, it was not used with a no set of norms that accompany the application of this principle. And uh, so it was a, a situation whereby we overdid, uh, it was overdone the, th the, the limits that uh, were implicit in responsibility to protect. And that was a create, created a response in the United Nations of the countries that thought that they had been abused by the, the utilization of responsibility to protect. But if we have called instead of uh, responsibility to protect the right to be protected, it would have been probably very different because that, those who need to be protected ask you, please help me, not the opposite. I mean, now we have the responsibility to protect the side, the one who is going to protect, not the one who needs to be protected. If he's the one who needs to be protected, the one who calls, I think the legality and all these things would be way much easier to handle. Now, this is an example of how the lack of, uh, of regulation, the lack of laws, the lack of, uh, of international uh, rules for the for the this uh, this uh, dramatic situations uh, have uh, taken us in that uh, diff difficult difficult situation i um, i look at now at uh, at uh, syria and uh, we see what is going on these days uh, the, the, i really really 
I'm very, very depressed with the situation now. Tomorrow you are going to have a debate in your parliament, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I am not going to, to say anything about that, but I'm going to tell you that the European Union, you like it or not, uh, is going to continue, and is going to continue doing this type of things well. We have determined to move in the right direction on security. And uh, we have going to, 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 we are going to do the utmost, if it's possible, with your country, but to try to see if we can apply these things. And, and the latest security um, the document by, the, by Madame Mogherini, all these ideas uh, are embryonic in it. So therefore, it's very easy that we can uh, uh, with the book already out, uh, give a much more uh, entity to that uh, to that document, and um, I think that uh, what I I would like to say is that uh, our idea, my idea, I don't I don't have any power to impose anybody. I'm a retired person, so but I still talk like if I were in power. But I mean, <laughs> I, I would recommend to those who are in power that uh, they have to 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 take uh, as far as Europe is concerned that it's. A, it's not an state, and it's something which uh, will never declare war on anybody, because we don't declare wars in the European Union. We don't go to war. But you may have to go into operations of this type that I would like to be on, probably on responsibility, I mean, right to be protected, but to somebody. And uh, I think we have to do with that reality in which we are living, you are living your country, London, and the uh, problems of internal security, and problems of external security, I think we have to begin to think that uh, security is a continuum, that there is internal security, and that continues internal external security, or reciprocally, it starts in external security, and that's happened in internal security. The examples are evident, uh, and I, this audience knows it very well. And uh, I think that uh, this is the way we have to structure our security, with this view of the internal and external and look at it from one pole only and then the continuum I think will be much uh, will be much easier to engage the, the, the civil society in these operations and much uh, easier to do and much cheaper to do. I think that the same type of equipment, the same type of capabilities are needed basically, basically fundamentally expensive ones for internal than for external enemies. So I think that this is the type of idea that we have, uh, uh, we would like to do in the European Union. And I'd like very much to thank again, Mary and Christine, and I hope that uh, in these uh, new ideas that uh, in the continent are going to be probably put forward, I would love very much to see that the United Kingdom is with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, our three speakers have admirably um, kept to, to time, but have also um, sketched out the, the huge terrain over which this book moves. So we can now, we've got a, at least uh, three quarters of an hour for questions, discussion. But the trick is in the name, question. So um, stick your hand up. I'll, I'll signify that uh, you can talk and then you can ask a question. There are three speakers and they're all on the stage. So the questions would be better to be quite short and end with a question mark. Right, yes. what seems to be like in the book. But here's a very naive question from a non-lawyer. If you tell me that a law needs changing, and it's in the UK, we can have a parliament and we can get the law changed if we get the right politics. How do you introduce a whole new set of international law? Right, yes, the woman in front. So if you just hand the microphone over, and I should have said if you could introduce yourselves before you ask a question, that might help the audience, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Kirsten Ainley, International Relations oh, Department at LSE. Thank you for a really fascinating presentation. I have two very quick questions, and they both got question marks at the end of them, Toby. Um, so the first is around crimes against humanity. So if you were to conceive of attacks on civilians, even by states, as crimes against humanity, and if you're not willing to try and prevent them using an R2P-type framework, you rely on prosecution. How do you deal with the fact that the ICC has shown itself totally incapable of fair prosecution 
globally um, of crimes against humanity and that the member states of the Rome Statute seem unwilling to either materially or rhetorically support the court. And then linked to that, because it comes from the importance to you of bottom-up support, is, is how do you deal with the tension between uh, complaining about an inconsistent legalism but supporting a bottom-up approach. So for some people, uh, a fragmented or pluralized international law is a good thing because it's more context sensitive. So individual hybrid tribunals and so on are good because they can respond to the individual uh, characteristics of the situation they're dealing with, but they do cause a problem for international law because they bring about these inconsistencies. So I just wondered if you could say a little more about the tension between wanting widespread support, including context sensitivity, and also wanting a consistent universal regime. Right, thank you. I love an LSE audience. I'll come back to the audience in a minute. We've got uh, three um, uh, questions that go two. right to the heart of the... Uh, heart, well, no, but the second is two. The, the, the first is, um, if international law needs changing, who changes it? And I think that was my, exactly my thought, that you seem to be calling for a counter-hegemonic campaign. Where does that come from? Secondly, Who's going to prosecute? Uh, I hope I'm not doing damage to the questions because the International Criminal Court has proved so p weak or so poor in uh, prosecuting crimes against humanity. And if, a bottom, if you're advocating a bottom-up approach, how do you get over inconsistency? Who wants to go first? Well, they sound like international law questions. <laughs> so um, I think I probably had better had. And they're the sort of questions that make me think the third alternative of throwing my hands up and saying, let's forget all about international law altogether um, is probably the right answer. Um, but given that international law is all we have, and given that um, we do need to, I think, continue to have at least um, some respect for it, let's sort of think um, rather more. Um, changing international law, um, there is no legislature. Um, there is no um, centralised lawmaking um, authority under international law. And so the classic ways of changing international law are through um, treaty, treaty making, essentially, or through various processes which, through consensus, through practice, through uniform behaviour, evolve what um, we all call rules of customary international law. Now, treaty making, and there was a great era of treaty making in the 60s, 70s, and huge number of multilateral treaties. Problem is, they are slow. Um, it, you need to get agreement you know, over the text. Then you need to get agreement um, to actually become a party to the treaty. Then you need to have agreement to actually give effect um, to the treaty. Um, having said that, when you do get a treaty, yes, there is consistency and certainty. And I think the big dilemma for states in terms of lawmaking today is that you can get um, agreement. We got agreement, let's come to Kristen's question at the um, same time. Um, we did get agreement over an ICC statute. Yeah, um, 1998, states came together. Okay, it links a bit with Javier's question. Um, there was strong resistance from some of the powerful states, states such as the United States, the um, Soviet, um, sorry, Russia, um, China, uh, other states are still not parties to the ICC. But um, there are also, I think, growing um, where you get, there are 193 states in the um, world community. We don't have to always just rely on the big five and so on, to be able to argue that there is um, a, an emerging, evolving international law. And that's where I think the really importance of the bottom-up approach comes. Where there is that um, resurgence, if you like, of um, approval of coming from civil society, coming from the NGO community, I think it does give a much greater weight to legality as well as legitimacy. Uh, and so we get the sort of the tension is not just universality at the bottom level, it's how it, in, it um, applies with the um, upper level as well. It's an imperfect system, but what I think is even more imperfect is what we have at the moment, which is claims being made by the powerful states that what they are doing is law. 
And that, I think, does have to be resisted strongly. The courts are disappointment. Um, you know, absolutely, if we go back to 1998, we were all cheering, you know, it was absolutely fantastic that we created an international criminal court. And yeah, um, so many years, 15 years since it began its work, it's bitterly disappointing in the way that it hasn't responded. So what are the, I mean, we've had these conversations, what are the answers? Hybrid courts involving international and local, located within um, local areas, um, more specialist courts such as those that we've seen in other regimes, like the WTO, um, for example, or the Law of the Sea Tribunal. Um, should we step back as well and say one of the big problems is that we in the West assumed that the ICC was going to be a court in our image and um, were not willing to see that there may be other models of justice that could have been effective in there. I mean, again, it's back to trying to, I think, have um, different thinking you know, around these things. Mary? Yeah, I wanted to add a few things. I mean, first of all, I don't know to what degree we're talking about changing international law or upholding those bits of international law that are relevant, because, of course, we have had since the end of the uh, Second World War a big growth of human rights law. Um, and other bodies of law. So that's one thing I wanted to say. But the other thing is that I think we were very influenced by the notion that, well, uh, this was taught to me by Christine, that law's a discourse, that a, a sort of constructivist view of international law. And um, there's a, 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 a book by Brunet and Toops, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but. It's about how law is produced by shared communities of practice, lawyers, civil society groups, states. And the way we thought about it was that each of our models involved different groups of people who saw international law in different ways. And the last, our model, human security, involved much more, to a much greater degree civil society <laughs> than the other models. And we have seen since the end of the Cold War the ways in which civil society groups have pressed for treaties. So we've got cluster munitions. Well, even earlier, the chemical and biological weapons conventions, the cluster munitions, uh, the land mines, and above all, the ICC. If the ICC was anything, it was really a product of pressure from civil society groups. So it depends who's involved. and it's. What we're really trying to do is to shift the discourse. So, it, you know, the bits of international law that are relevant for human security. For instance, on international humanitarian law, we would never say get rid of it, but rather we'd say complement it by human rights law. And when there are differences of interpretation, human rights, as it were, trumps humanitarian law. Uh, so maybe we didn't make that clear enough. And I agree with Christine about the ICC. Again, it's, you know, the ICC has been in a way totally undermined by geopolitical thinking around how these trials are conducted. And it's a matter of changing, changing people's ideas about the world. That's what the book is really an attempt to try to get people to think differently. <laughs> right. I think I have three questions. Yes. In the light blue top and then yes and then yes. Uh, Ronan Tynan. Uh, actually, I'm quite traumatized by what's going on in Syria, and not just in terms of the actual crimes that are committed on a systematic basis by the combatants, particularly by the regime and Russia. It does not in any way to excuse the coalition, their activities in Iraq at the moment. But really, I just want to ask a question, because it seems to me that international law has really, if you look at the Syria case study, has been not just irrelevant, it's played no role whatsoever in mitigating, reducing, or stopping the conflict. You know, the Russian vetoes at the start, which protected the regime, and allowed the conflict to accelerate when civilians were being gunned down in the street. And even talk about advances in human rights law. 
the Assad regime, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, and very, I've spoken to all these people, uh, have documented terrible abuses. Said Naya Prison, described as a slaughterhouse in an Amnesty report, language not normally used by Amnesty, in fact, often very cautiously used. I mean, depravities of a level that, you know, are almost mind-numbing. Something that really, you know, resonates with what the Nazis did on a systematic basis during the Holocaust. And I know that comparison. I, I almost regret using that, but in fairness, some of the images that have emerged border on that. I, I, the reason, Mr. Chairman, I, I really want to put the question, I came really because this book struck me as having some potential to get people thinking, because you bring it back to basics. You bring it back to people. People are invisible in Syria. It's discussed as a geopolitical discussion, and particularly the left has been disgraceful, the way it has backed Assad, because he's been opposed to the United States, for example. I know that might sound crude to some people, but just think about it. We really hear very little about civilians in the Syrian conflict. I really want to ask you about your model, how you hope your model might make a difference in making us think about that. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Mr. Yeah, we've got thank your question. You. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if you keep your hand up, the mic will come to you and then I'll come to you third. Yeah. No, just pass the, the mic along. The, yeah. We'll get there in the end. Great, and then the mic here. Hi, so um, I'm a summer school student. I will take the session three about the international war crimes. Uh, my question, actually, j it's it's from uh, my education in public international law last semester in the States. My professor uh, was criticizing ICC. One of the reasons is that it's being too political. Uh, many of its decisions are political matters, and I just wonder, Maybe you mentioned that in your book. I haven't read it yet, but I'm going to like whether you, um, whether your model is gonna solve that problem. Like, repeat what the problem with the ICC is. Too political. Too political. Okay. Uh, that's one of the critics by my professor. So I'm just wondering whether this will solve that issue. So uh, like criminal tribunals or other types of international laws that's gonna change that. Great. Got it. Thanks. Hi. Um, my name's Maya Gustafsson. I'm an incoming master student at LSE. And, um, well, David Kilcullen and others have emphasized the um, cities and the role of new rules and uh, asymmetrical conflict in cities. And I was just wondering if um, cities, han have, uh, cities have any role um, to play in the reformulation of the international law in your book. Mm. So this is the relationship between conflict in cities and international yeah. law. Yeah, and one final so question. I didn't quite get that. Yeah, I'll, I'll recap. Hello, my name is Fahad, and I am second year law student in the University of Liverpool, and I have one question. My question is, do you think that the right of veto shall be prohibited in the UN because it prevents the state to use the military force to protect the people who have been oppressed by the state? As you know, in Syria, every time they want to attack Syria and Russia make a veto for it, so nothing changed. Excellent. We have four questions, and quite right, I think Syria looms large. First, what can your model say about the undoubted crimes against humanity in Syria that seem to have made international law irrelevant? And it's not all of the left that backed Assad, but I take your point on that. The, the, the second point is... Uh, uh, a critique of the International Criminal Court from an unnamed professor. Um, is it simply failing because it's too political? That's, yeah. uh, the third is citing David Kilcullen, and I won't comment on his attitude towards international law, but his work on conflict, his argument in his new book about conflict being primarily urban, that problems, to quote his rather purple prose, is coming down from the hills into the cities. What does international law have to say about combat in the city. And, and the, first, the, the final question, again, coming back to Syria as the case study, uh, given the absolute uh, inability of the United Nations Security Council to do anything about Syria and a chain of other conflicts, should we remove the veto and what would be the consequences of that? Let's start with Mary, go to Christine and then end up with Javier because I'm sure he's got some things to say. Well, of course you're absolutely right. I mean not only are people ignoring international law, but they're deliberately violating it. I really never expected in my life to see deliberate attacks on hospitals. 
the way it's happening in Syria, for example, and that's only one example, the use of phosphorus, the use of napalm, the use of chemical weapons. So yes, they're deliberately ignoring international law. So do we then throw up our hands and say international law is not relevant? I sort of think Syria makes the case even stronger for strengthening international law, for documenting. We need to document those war crimes. Uh, what I want to say is your point very much about um, the people in Syria uh, raises, I realize I forgot to answer the last question about bottom up. <laughs> and I do think that the only way you can address the Syrian problem is not by more force, but by focusing on those areas which are relatively peaceful and trying to build some kind of legitimacy. And the key people for legitimacy are civil society, which is actually quite strong in Syria. It was much stronger at the beginning of the war. And you know what you saw in Syria, which is actually very similar to what you saw in Bosnia and very similar to what you saw in Ukraine, is that the war began with a democracy movement. And then the government attacks the democracy movement and accuses it of being terrorist or Sunni or whatever and turns it into an ethnic conflict. So ethnicity turns out to be a consequence rather than a cause of the conflict. So when I was talking about bottom up, I was actually talking about these quite, not so much about international law, but about practical human security responses. Having said that, I'm not actually romantic about bottom-up. Bottom-up includes terrible people as well as good people. <laughs> the issue really is to combine bottom-up and top-down. So what I was really saying was more bottom-up. I mean, I think there's a tendency to just talk to the warring parties, not to recognize that actually this war was intended to end democracy. It was actually a war against civil society, and civil society should be treated as an actor. Uh, not as just something, uh, as a nice add-on. So I agree with you. It's terribly important to take people and civilians, and you can't solve these problems without taking people seriously. I'm going to answer the question on cities as well, because I think this is a really interesting question. I haven't actually yet read David Kilkellen's no. new book, but I'm very interested in the issue of urban, the increasingly urban nature of warfare, which is partly the consequence of the dramatic growth of urbanization, which in turn is a consequence of contemporary wars because in many wars, people move out of the countryside and into towns and they never return to the countryside. So wars, I mean, towns like Kabul in Afghanistan, uh, Pristina in Kosovo, Goma in Eastern Congo have become so much bigger as a consequence of war. Now, the thing about, um, you know, old wars, they much preferred having them in the countryside. You la had your battles in fields. You tried to avoid having them in cities. <laughs> and now people like Kilcullen says, well, you know, high-rise buildings are the equivalent of jungles and mountains and the gorilla hides among the... But it's much more difficult to deal with those. And I think there is a real argument that, and this is my colleague Saskia Sassin makes this argument, that towns have something called urban capabilities. Towns themselves, organization of towns that somehow counter many of these tendencies. There's a, some lovely examples, Reem Turkmani, who's here, can talk about them from, from Syria. Uh, there's a dairy farm in eastern Ghouta that produces most of the yogurt for Damascus. Now, it was in opposition-held areas, but because the government needed the yogurt, they made a deal with the dairy farmer, and that's one of the most peaceful areas in Eastern in Ghouta, which is under siege in general. And it's become an area where displaced people have, um, have gone to because it's safe. Or there's another lovely example of something called the people of Aleppo, who are basically engineers who decided to form a group to keep electricity, water, 
um, and uh, going. And because, unfortunately, at the time they were working, the government controlled the electricity, in Islamic State controlled the diesel oil, and Jabhat al-Nusra controlled the water, the only way they could keep the pipes going was by negotiating with all three of them. <laughs> so there are lots of examples of those kinds which can be uh, built upon. I mean, one of the arguments, I think, about urban capabilities comes from a traditional view of towns as cosmopolitan centers. And actually, once you get these megacities, it's really no longer true. You have ethnic ghettos, you have walls, you have all these huge problems of cities. So um, maybe we're seeing something quite new, but I think this is a whole area of research that we need to do more of. Christine. Um, right, I would agree with the unnamed professor. The ICC is certainly losing, um, it is becoming over-politicised, and I mean, I, th I think that at the end of the day, it's up to the court themselves to realise that they're losing legitimacy. They're losing that place in the international um, framework if they can't be seen as operating in accordance with the rule of law and so on. But I think sort of just sort of two add-ons to that. Um, what we have seen um, in the last, what, six months, 12 months, are states withdrawing from the International Criminal Court. South Africa, um, Gambia, Burundi, I think, have all done so. We've had the African Union coming out and making a statement about it. Um, that should be alarming the court. And you know, judges should be reflective and asking themselves, you know, what is going on here? And equally, the prosecution with respect to prosec um, prosecuting um, prosecutorial policies. But I think that there is another side as well. What the court has done has been to develop the concept of international criminal law. And I think at the end of the day, what is going to be far more important than the ICC's own position is the domestication of international criminal law into national domestic courts and building on the jurisprudence that is put out there um, to create a body of international criminal law that is operating. We're seeing it, for example, in Argentina, where there are cases that are now being um, brought to the courts in Argentina using, in many instances, international standards and looking back at the period which was what now, two, three decades ago, that nobody ever thought there would be any cases coming out from. And so I don't think one just has to look at the criminal, International Criminal Court with these particular judges at this particular moment. It's an institution that must develop its own legitimacy, but also has um, further effect. Um, the veto, well, of course, I mean, the strict legal answer is the veto can't be removed without an amendment to the United Nations Charter. Um, the UN Charter has only ever been amended, I think it's twice um, since 1945, both times purely to add extra members to the Security Council, other bodies, not in any way um, to do anything um, substantive with it. Um, over the various, you know, over the various decades, there's been all sorts of different suggestions. Um, at the time of the Iraq war, there was talk about the unreasonable use of the veto. And other people have put forward that um, the veto should not be available when there is a question of, for example, responding to um, situations of alleged genocide. So there's been various I ideas. The short answer at the end of the day is, it's the political power block. And while those states um, that have got the veto are entrenched with it, no, there's not going to be any change. Where I actually see a bigger problem is that the General Assembly hasn't stepped up where the Security Council is blocked because of the veto. That's where you've got the 193 states. Yeah, um, If they use their power within the General Assembly, then I think there could be a lot more, um, um, lot more traction um, around those particular issues, those states. Um, there have been resolutions from the General Assembly on Syria, uh, not enough of them, not strong enough. And I think there's a much broader responsibility among states than just looking at those that have got the veto. 
Javier, uh, uh, just a Maybe. couple of things. If you could reflect for us with all your years of standing about what the significance for international law and international organizations is of the Syrian horror. But more importantly, and I'm picking up on Christine's point, why do you think the General Assembly hasn't stood up and made its voice collectively heard? It, would, it, would that be a possible alternative to a clearly blocked uh, Security Council? And also, you have yeah, something to say about okay. cities. <laughs> OK, about, uh, about the, the Security Council. I, I'm not optimistic, but I'm not as pessimistic as it used to be about the potential adaptation of uh, the behavior of the members, permanent members of the Security Council. I can imagine, uh, not tomorrow, but I can imagine a possibility of having in the foreseeable future the member, permanent members saying themselves that in case A, case B, case C, we will not use veto. Or we will need two countries or two vetoes in order to, or three vetoes or something. And this is not very far. It was, I mean, it's, but it was thought uh, not long ago about the possibility. And I think one country, member of the Security Council, advanced the possibility of taking himself that, uh, that, that, uh, that position. At the end, it didn't take place. Uh, nobody did it. But uh, I think that is not impossible. I mean, today is more difficult than yesterday because the situation in the international community today is much more difficult. I mean, the, 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 we are in a, in a world in which uh, the order is breaking apart. And they, they will say, see, first, how do we recuperate a certain order in the, in the world of today? I mean, the, these days are really very critical on that, on that matter. Now, the second thing, I would like to say something about cities. Uh, I tend to think that what you see on cities is not conflict that we can call war. I think it's much more criminal actions. I think criminal actions which are massive is like a war, no? but they're criminal actions that have to be dealt with as criminal actions. Take a, take a city, for instance, the city of Mexico. You don't have to go to Africa. The city of Mexico is, is, is militarized, uh, but uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a fight against a crime, not a, it's not a question of ethnics which are fighting uh, crimes, which, I mean, uh, organizations which are fighting against themselves. The organized crime acts normally in cities because it's much easier to do it. Uh, this. And, uh, but uh, I think that in general terms, uh, in Congo, for instance, with some exceptions, the, the, the big battles have been done in the countryside. So crime, yes, and, uh, but uh, the crime organized, uh, it looks like an, an army, it looks like a war, but it's, it's crime. It's a different story than that. Now, the, the second thing I would like to say is, uh, is on the issue of Syria. And let me, let me, let me go a little, bit, uh, a little bit before Syria in the year 2011. Um, 2011, uh, Egypt, uh, Mubarak goes away, and Tunisia goes away, uh, the, the president, and we had a big, big problem in Libya. And I think Libya, if you uh, allow me to say this, it's, uh, it's easy to say today. In Libya, we didn't handle the situation properly. In Libya, and many militaries ask us to, to Mary in particular also, in Libya, Benghazi could have been handled differently. And Benghazi could have been closed. And I think, for instance, the European Union could have closed Benghazi and, and maintained the other part. It was not that dramatic. And uh, we didn't do that. And we entered into some people, uh, really coming from uh, the organized, uh, organized part of the civil society in France or in other places, decided that uh, it had to be bombed. And it was bombed. And it was bombed without, uh, without need, I think, with not much uh, liking of many of the countries that participated. And uh, with a very clear, and this is the most important thing I'm going to say for that, very clear statement by Russia and very clear statement by China that its responsibility to protect is used 
we will be very carefully doing if you overdo it. And if you overdo it, forget it. And we overdid it. And the Chinese and the Russians have not forgotten. And when we go for the first time to the Syria case, China and Russia say no, no way, no way. And has continued until today, even with all the catastrophes that happened. With that, I don't want to justify anything, but uh, things when are doing badly, and uh, when you advise, please don't do that, and you do it, then uh, you have to carry with some of the consequences. Therefore, I think in Syria we should have done a much, much, much bigger effort. Much, much bigger effort because we had, uh, I mean, the, the worst in the world to say it, because we had some obligations because part of the responsibility was on Russia and China because of what happened in Libya. I mean, again, this is not a justification of anything, but um, it's a reflection of how things are very, we have to think very well how we do things and look very clear to the consequences. The concept of regime change by force has been a tremendous mistake. Okay, a thank you. Um, we've, I'm gonna come up to the uh, balcony now and I can see three questions and the first person I saw is there with the glasses with your hand up, thank you. Hi, my name is Natasha and I'm a trainee solicitor. Uh, my question has to do with the extraterritorial application of human rights treaties, especially in the context of drone attacks. So I'm thinking about Article 2 of the ECHR, um, which is violated when a contracting state conducts a targeted killing on a foreign soil. Um, and do you believe that it's legitimate to extend jurisdiction in that context um, on the basis that the contracting state is exercising control over the individual on the ground. And if you don't believe it's legitimate, then how do we hold states accountable for actions which would constitute violations of human rights on its own soil? Thank you. Excellent. And then uh, there with the stripy T-shirt <coughs> behind you. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Bogdan Tsuk and I'm a Ukrainian journalist. Uh, regarding you Speak up, um, please. Regarding uh, Russian uh, war in Ukraine, military actions, um, which are at low intensity now, but we still have more than 10,000 people dead and more than a million dis displaced. Uh, Ukraine is pursuing a number of ways to get justice in international courts. Uh, courts. And um, any members of the panel, uh, do, you, do you follow um, uh, those, uh, those actions, especially in ICJ, uh, International Court of Justice? Do you think Ukraine is doing it the right way. Any, do you see any hope that justice could be reached? Excellent, thank you. There was a final question in the balcony. Yes, there, sir. Uh, good evening, I'm Julian, an anthropology student over at, uh, at SOAS. Uh, thank you very much for the book and for the presentation. Uh, in the book, you mentioned that uh, some non-state armed groups have adopted some or all of the constraints of international humanitarian law and suggest that this may be uh, in order to sort of a calculation to improve their uh, legitimacy locally and internationally. Um, and I was wondering if in your research you'd come across any instances where armed groups own sort of endogenous ideas of, of use in Bello did overlap with the principles of IHL. And if not, does that at all trouble the universal claim that IHL makes? Right, and any questions here? Just one or two more. Yes, uh, yeah, you with the blue top, the, put your, keep your hand up, yes you, yeah, there you go. The mic is with you. Purple top, sorry. Thank you. Sheila Triggs, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. I'd like to bring together a few points that you uh, raised about the General Assembly, the 193 states, making treaties and the power of civil society and the power of powerful states to ask you about um, the currently being discussed treaty to ban nuclear weapons and how a treaty that has come up from the General Assembly is being boycotted by um, the uh, uh, P5 and so on, um, can actually make progress internationally. Brilliant, and the, f the final question just in front of you. 
There you go. Thank. Thank you very much. Uh, Pears and Banson King's College. So very quickly, how um, how much hope is there? And really, what might be your strategies as teachers, the two of you, yes, when uh, you confront international law students, and they go through their training, and in your classes, yes, they will hear about a gender perspective. They might hear about third world approaches to international law. But the majority of students, they are never even touched by any of this. And dare I say, many of our colleagues will never mention that to them either. And so that very intriguing approach that you suggest to bring an international relations and public international law scholar together with somebody who has pioneered work on global civil society, that's exactly the kind of critique that we need nowadays. But many of our colleagues, the mainstream public international lawyers, they don't do it. Our students have never heard of these things. Could you turn it into a question? <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> what, what I, the, the question was, what's the strategy that we should pursue? What's the strategy? Yeah, right, the board. Okay, <laughs> we've got 10 minutes left. And of course, at 8 o'clock, it's going to be quite time consuming because you've all got to leave here, go and buy a book and come back to, to get it signed. So we've got probably about 3.3 minutes each for each of our three participants to answer. I'll start with Mary, then to Christine and give Javier the last line. So Mary. Oh gosh, I'm, I don't know how we're going to divide this up. Um, Christine is much better at answering the law questions than me, especially on drones. But what I want to say about drones is that the problem with drones is that the US treats this as a war of global reach. And so you can kill anyone anywhere <laughs> because they count as combatants and therefore it's considered legal. And to anybody else, this is targeted assassination. This is not a war, and this is precisely the problem of international law. I mean, of course, actually, it's quite hard to dis define this as a conflict, as a war, since it happens everywhere. But nevertheless, the fact that the US says it's a war and therefore it's legal to co kill combatants is how they legitimize what they do. Also, there's a real argument about consent. How can a country consent to have its own citizens killed? Surely no state, if we believe in human rights, sovereignty does not extend to giving consent to another state to kill its own citizens. So there are lots of reasons to be very critical about, and, and Christine will no doubt give, me, give a more legalistic answer than I have. I'm surprised that we say armed groups operate within international humanitarian law, quite the opposite. What we say is that, the, you know, killing civilians is a deliberate, violence in new wars is primarily against civilians. And to deliberately kill civilians is contrary to international humanitarian law. So, you know, I, there may be a few cases, and, and Christine may be more aware of it, and maybe that's what we said, but in general, <laughs> international, in, in general, armed groups deliberately violate international humanitarian law. And actually, it's really fascinating to think about this because for soldiers, being trained in international humanitarian law is absolutely key to what constitutes a soldier. Uh, because after all, how do you draw a distinction between a soldier and a murderer? You draw a distinction by saying this is legal killing. And it's legal killing both because the war has been, is a legitimate phenomenon and because the soldier operates within the framework of the law. So international humanitarian law is incredibly important for soldiers. What you see happening in contemporary wars is it's not only armed groups that neglect it, it's also private security contractors. So what, you know, a very typical pattern is that the, um, the regular forces will shell at a distance, and of course they can claim they're shelling military targets and civilians are being killed by mistake, but they'll send in the militias to do the dirty work of killing because the militias are not bound in the same way as they are by international humanitarian law. Same with private, it was private security contractors who were doing torture in Abu Ghraib. So uh, as to whether they have rules Actually, I think there are certain codes, whether we would consider them acceptable and whether, I mean, I do think that where there, if, if you look at, for instance, the history of international humanitarian law, 
actually it goes back historically a long way, and we talk about that in the book, and it comes from many different traditions. The Islamic tradition is actually stronger than the Christian tradition on international humanitarian law, and we talk about that. The Hindu tradition, the Confucian tradition, all of these, many of the rules that were codified in the 19th century come from other traditions. So it's not, it, it's not actually true that this, is, that this was a Western tradition. Nevertheless, it is certainly true that, for instance, among Islamic State, they spend hours, they study the Quran in trying to justify what they do in terms, and we've heard some really fascinating examples of, of, of uh, they study what they do in order to justify, and of course, by any universalistic standards, these are pretty terrible rules, but they do have their own rules. So to the extent that they want to prove to themselves that their soldiers are not and martyrs and not criminals, then they do invent their own rules. But I think it's terribly important that it be accepted generally. Um, uh, there was, I wanted to say one thing going back to the previous question, which, was, which I should have said about Syria, and to really agree with what Javier said about regime change, whether you're talking about Libya, if you'd taken a human rights approach rather than a political approach, what you would have done in Syria was not call for Assad to go, but condemn the fact that he was killing his own citizens and condemn the bombing. <laughs> and put pressure on him from, from a human rights perspective, likewise with Gaddafi, and protect those people who are being bombed, but not push forward to regime change. Regime change may happen, but what we see in all cases is that regime change by force doesn't work. And just a, one final word. It's I'm, your book signing. What? You're coming between you and your book signing. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say something about Ukraine. Chris, Christine, you've got, you've got three or four questions. One is the extraterritorial okay. human rights law and drone attacks. Is Ukraine doing the right thing to go through the International uh, uh, Criminal Court? You can deal with, but Mary, I think, has dealt very well with the uh, armed groups and international human rights law. I think you have to answer the specific question on the, the uh, treaty to ban uh, nuclear weapons coming from the General Assembly but being boycotted by the P5. And finally, we'll leave the question, what's the strategy for transformation to Javier's last word? Right. Every single one of these questions is an hour-long international law class. So if we've got, um, you know, several hours to go. Um, I think the fascinating thing about the drones is that if one looks at the issue of legality of drones under IHL or under human rights law, you have to ask a whole set of different questions and come up with different answers. It's a totally different legal analysis. And I think that that's one of the big problems around um, application of international law. Um, as you know, the extraterritorial application of human rights law is um, extremely controversial. The United States, for example, completely um, rejects it, although it has now apparently accepted it in the context of torture. Um, and what we really are into with the context of drones is, as you said, whether you know, attack from the air essentially amounts to sufficient control and authority to allow for the extraterritorial application under um, Article 1 of the ECHR or, um, or Article 2 of the ICCPR, or whether, um, in fact, that is so removed, as in the case of the NATO bombing um, with former Yugoslavia. So it's a highly controversial issue. Um, it goes back to the issue of excessive legalism in argument, um, I think. Um, Ukraine. Ukraine is doing precisely what Nicaragua has done, what the um, Democratic Republic of Congo has done, um, what Serbia did. All of these um, countries have taken cases to the International Court of Justice, um, where possible also to a um, regional human rights court, European Court of Human Rights. Um, yeah, I think it's a perfectly appropriate strategy. Um, it makes the court develop the jurisprudence around um, application of the use of force if the case gets that far. There's always the admissibility um, jurisdiction um, type issues. I'm not sure quite where the Ukraine case has got on those particular areas yet. Um, 
yeah, the courts are there as a tool. And I mean, clearly, if we go back to one of the most classic cases of challenge of the use of force through the ICJ, the Nicaragua case in the 1980s, the judgment of the court quite clearly did have political impact in the long term. So yeah, I think it's a, a good strategy to pursue. I would just add on the non-state armed groups, and of course, common article three of um, the Geneva Conventions assumes that non-state armed groups will take on um, international humanitarian law. And yes, there are um, cases where they do so and do say that they will comply with IHL. And there's interesting research coming out at the moment, which I think could really be pursued, that there are instances of non-state armed groups that very clearly, for example, will not engage in sexual violence and rape in armed conflict, precisely because they see that as being contrary to the laws of war. And I think if we could learn more through research about why and when non-state armed groups will comply with IHL and what are the um, parameters within which they act, I think that would be an extremely useful um, basis for further decision making. Um, I don't know what the answer is, I'm afraid, as you say, to the nuclear, which I suspect you knew was going to be my answer, um, to the nuclear, not um, the, uh, not non I want to say the MPT, the um, ban on nuclear weapons um, convention. I mean, it's been around for so long. Yes, we are moving up through the General Assembly. Um, what is the purpose of a treaty which the nuclear powers aren't party to? And all I can say on that is, again, that pressure keeping on. Uh, maybe I should just add that I was involved in a case brought by the Marshall Islands against the United Kingdom precisely around the duty to negotiate a treaty on banning nuclear weapons in accordance with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and in accordance with what the International Court of Justice said back in 1996. The court essentially threw the case out on um, lack of any dispute. I still find it difficult to see how there is no dispute between the non-nuclear states and the nuclear states on precisely this issue. Maybe that also links back to whether it's worth going to the court with the um, Ukraine case. Tell them to buy our book and read it can be the only strategy <laughs> for bringing um, new blood into international law courses. Have it. We, we're over time. If you no, have well, one minute. One minute and less than one minute. Uh, I don't have anything to add to the uh, they have uh, answered very well all the questions. I just want to, to, to say thank you very much, both of them, and thank you very much to you for having uh, spent with us this time. And I hope that we will continue working in that direction and uh, we will make some progress. Thank you very much. I think it's... Wait a minute, we haven't finished yet. I, I think it's testament to, to the superb speeches we've given, which are a mere faint reflection of the expertise in this book, that on a hot night where you could have all been uh, relaxing in a bar, you've stayed right to the end, in fact, over the end. Now, I know I forgot to mention something earlier on. The book is actually for sale outside, <laughs> and, and, and uh, these two august professors will sit here and sign uh, the hundreds of copies you buy. So if you just go outside, buy the book and bring it back, they'll sign it. But more important, not, no, not quite any more importantly, but equally importantly, can you thank our three speakers for an excellent and, uh, speech? <laughs>